depending on what we're doing, there may be some liberty, uh, some leeway of, of or the order in which things can happen, and other times you're constrained by what you're doing to do things in particular order. If you're constrained, there's not a whole lot you can do. But if you do have some liberty on, on where you can put things in the pipeline, what you want to do first is reduce, minimize the amount of data in your pipeline as early as you can. You want your data size to go like this, then build gradually to the end. If you end up adding a bunch of data, you're making every stage of the pipeline after that handle more. So the more you make the computer work, the more time it takes to do it. So it's like um, it's like in the old days for uh, firefighters, the bucket line for water. Exactly. Exactly. There are certain options you need to be careful of. Um, these are the ones that, that I know of that are the biggest offenders. Um, the the uh, most option on tar, I've seen it slow stuff down by a lot more than four times. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with a lot of, uh, a lot of small files, uh, if you're displaying the, the path of the file as you're tarring it up, you can see more of it more like a 10 times difference between verbose and not verbose. Especially if you're putting through like a serial console. Absolutely. Like a whole VGA or Visa. Yes. Because raster lines only go so fast. Right. Because when we put, throw a v, the V option on TAR, we're saying, tell me what you're doing. We're asking the computer to do more. Asking it to do more it takes longer to do it. If we set gzip to a higher level of compression, uh, same thing happens. We end up making gzip work a lot harder for a given amount of output. It's going to slow things down. Usually the difference in compression between the default and the minus 7, minus 8, and minus 9, usually the level of command is not, or the level of compression is not all that big compared to the amount of extra time it's taking. Um, let's see, the block size option on DV. I've seen between, if you have a block size of one, compare that, compare your speed to a block size of say 20,000 to 30,000, you can have uh, more than a factor of 100. I've seen a uh, factor of more than 300 speed on that. So you want to make your block size option as big as what your script can tolerate and uh, it'll, it'll go a lot faster. Any questions on it? I yeah. assume some hard drives too uh, have the, uh, what's it called, uh, well the uh, block size of the, like uh, they used to do five, uh, uh, five k sectors, right. and then he wants you to do uh, one or uh, four meg sectors. Okay. Yes. So I assume the like pump and pop too for that would probably increase it a lot. Exactly. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of times, not only the size of the block size, but it's, what is the visible block? If you put your block size to something that's even more visible by, say, the block size of the data on your disk, then that's going to tend to bump your speed up as well. Because you're dealing with whole blocks instead of part of one and then, then part of another. Here are the rules, rules of thumb that I kind of came upon. Um, the less you ask a computer to do, the faster you can do it. Um, that's basically the most important question to ask yourself as you're looking to, to increase your speed. How can I ask this computer to do less while I'm getting the stuff that I need to do? And a lot of times, this kind of surprised me. Most obvious way to do something that is often a very inefficient way to do it. You put a little bit more thought into it, you can come up with something that's uh, not as intuitive, but a heck of a lot faster. Just like that first uh, example we saw with the sort command, that last that last line 
isn't something you would naturally come up with as a first try. But you can get there by asking that question. You can get there. Based on any starting point, you can still get to a fast way of doing it. Uh, do whatever, do as much as you can in data stream form. Uh, be mindful of the work that's been done previously. If you've already got something sorted, you need a derivative of that or an easy, easy morph of it, you make use of that. Know all the benefits and costs of what you're asking the computer to do. And that's where the time command comes in. Um, that's where looking at your I.O. and various other things comes in. Okay, Chris, this one's for you. Uh, Chris and I were talking a, couple, a month or two ago at another meeting about your typical way of using a command pipeline is command pipe, command pipe. It's a point to point, no matter what you want to do, it's going to start here and end there, and there's no deviation in that. Well, I needed it to do something else. So I sat down. I don't know if anybody else came up with anything like this. If I had to guess, I'd say probably yes. But if you have a pipeline, you set up a subshell right there, those two parentheses, and you have a condition. If that condition is satisfied, the whole data stream will go through here. If that's not satisfied, and this is, then it will go through the second alternative. If neither is satisfied, the data stream will just blow through the whole um, Subshell and change. You can come up using this simple idea here. You can come up with some really um, interesting switching schemes for for uh, shells. In fact, one that I use every day is we've got two maintenance computers. One is for uh, the non-production boxes. The other one is set up to talk to the production boxes. And I wanted to be able to run the same script on either one, but use a different set of host names because they're limited. The two boxes are limited on exactly which hosts they talk to. And so I have a flight file on the, on the system that says if, that, if this file exists, then use this grep minus W minus F, and then it has the list of uh, production hosts, and the other one has the list of non-production hosts, and I can copy the script back and forth between the two systems, and it automatically adapts to wherever it is. And it only took two lines to set it up. Here we get to the benchmarking, which was your question. Um, a lot of times it's not obvious what command or what approach is going to be faster. So what you can do is set up a, some sample data and or a sample situation, whatever, and time it. And that time command will give you an output of how much real time, how much uh, CPU time, and so forth you used. And you run that a few times, average the results, and you can get a real good idea of how one alternative compares to the other. You can compare different commands, you can compare different blocks or different option sizes to one another. Uh, I actually did this on the DD command to find out how big of a difference the speed was just based on the value of that one option there. These are some basic techniques for speeding up your, your shell scripts. Um, if you follow these techniques to the extent you follow the technique, that's the kind of speed up you're going to get on your scripts. Usually, 
you can speed up the script at least a little bit. Sometimes you can do a whole bunch. Uh, just like I, I promised you that, that we look at a, a, a situation where you have a factor of 1,000 difference. If you have a large file like a big ISO file or you know, something more like gigabytes and you want it to be in a different place, if it's on the same file system, use the move command because all that's doing is changing some file pointers in the file system. If you use the copy and then remove approach, uh, you can easily take a thousand times more time to do that because you're asking the computer to do a lot more. Instead of changing a few bytes in a file table, you're asking move you know, mobile gigabytes from here to there. And that's, of course, going to take a lot more time. something else. I haven't said much of anything about this, but there's a mindset that goes along with those techniques. If you master the techniques for speeding up your shell scripts, you'll end up with faster shell scripts. If you master the mindset behind that, everything you write will be faster, no matter what language it is. Because this puts you in a position position or frame of mind to see the opportunities that you can do. Whether the technique has been written down by anybody or not, you will see the technique if you're thinking in these terms. One of the most important things is when all you have is one idea, you have no idea what you have. The true value of a given idea can be known only in the context of other ideas to which you can be compared. That's where, in order to get faster speed, you have to compare alternatives. I may have three or four different ways I can do something. One of the most frustrating things about writing that book is I kept finding out that my treasured way of doing a certain thing was 20 times slower than something else I've ever <laughs> thought of. And I kept running across that thing. Dang, I wish I could go, go back and rewrite about 200 scripts that I've already written because they were dog slow. I had, and, and when I initially started testing out all those techniques and so forth, I thought, all right, let me take something I've written before and rewrite it using those techniques. And I had written a, a shell program that solved that Cracker Barrel 15 peg puzzle. You know, you, you, you got one over the hole and got a triangle. That you know, after two days of runtime, I found out that there are 27,900 solutions for the one peg open at the top. Two days, all right? I rewrote it using that. Would anybody like to guess? What my runtime was on the same computer. Two seconds. It was two minutes. Just shy of two minutes. It was over a 1,500 time reduction in time. How many solutions were there? Um, for that one? For the puzzle. For the puzzle, were 27,900 if you start with the open peg at the top. I, since it only took two minutes to compute that, I put it in a loop and did them all. In 25 <laughs> minutes, I had all the solutions no matter no matter where you start. But I thought, you know what? People need to hear about that. <laughs> not, not about the solutions I found the Cracker Wheel puzzle, but this is the kind of game you can sometimes get. But that's where I found out that shell variables involve some overhead. I did all the heavy processing in awk in my second thing because awk could, could do it all in a stream internally and awk also handles variables a lot more quickly <coughs> and conditionals more quickly. And so if you've got a choice between doing something just in the shell and doing something awk, uh, if you're going to shove a bunch of data through it, I'd say Look into doing it on, 
or at least do it uh, a benchmark on the two approaches. Do, yes. Do you understand the sort command? Uh, the inner workings of it? To a degree. I, I've never studied. Uh, you know if it uses the asking number for the alpha or numeric character? Don't know that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a newbie. Oh, that's okay. That's a good question. I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> Anybody um, else know? No. Yeah. What, ver uh, what version and what distribution is this? Um, was this developed on? Because I'm sure you can. Can you take the same thing and run it in Solaris versus um, AIX? Uh, I have successfully done that on AIX. On HPUX, the uh, to answer your question, this was done partly on Fedora and then on CentOS. That's what my, my main uh, system runs. But I also tested a lot of things on other other systems, SUSE and uh, AIX in particular. The interesting thing is all the tools you're using are G, uh, GMU tools. They're not bound by the actual dish of Exactly. Yeah. A lot of this is, is totally portable between different flavors of, uh, of Unix. As long as you use the GNU uh, tools, you're going to find this, the same uh, general results. There are going to be some variances, of course, because of differences in operating systems and versions of operating systems and hardware and all that and so forth. But you're going to come up with the same kind of flavor. What would you notice mostly about differences? Like, like uh, is there like different POSIX systems like uh, Unix, like a BSD versus a Linux that would act differently or is it just kind of really random there? I didn't uh, test it on BSD, but based on what, I'm, or what I've seen between the other ones, um, they tend to track each other fairly closely because the real power of it is, is in the logic behind what's, what's being done. I mean, reading, one or reading a file once and reading it twice, that's always going to act the same uh, no matter where you go because you are, it, it, it's a logical type of thing. Not, it's, it's not isolated in any particular uh, file system type or operating system. Yeah, or higher. Exactly, yeah. And that's why the mindset stuff is transportable or applicable to just about any type of uh, command-based language. I've used that mindset on assembler, on shell, on C programming, on various versions of basic. It's, it, it works no matter what you're on because it's, it's based in the logic of it rather than in the particulars of the language. Uh, what version of Bash, considering Bash is being maintained at Case West Reserve? It's, I've never noticed a difference between one version of Bash and the, and the other as far as, as... Because he does make changes. Oh yes, yes. And I expect that in, in certain circumstances you will see some sort of a significant difference between one version of Bash and another. But uh, when I was working in production, supporting production for Motorola down in Fort Worth years ago, um, the, the plant manager was overjoyed whenever we could show a 10% or 20% increase in productivity. We're talking, in some of these things, we're talking five times, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times. Uh, so it's, I'm sure there are differences, but the the order of magnitude <coughs> is, uh, it's still good news. Yes? Would you mind backing up to the slide with the sort and reverse example, please? Sure. Thanks. <coughs> yes. Uh, that one? Yes. So I'm just looking at this with an eye towards what happens as the size of your input varies. I know you mentioned that there was some constant speed up, but some operations like sort might have nonlinear behaviors oh, as yes. input size varies. Yes, I would expect that to happen. Um, as far as the more duplicates we have, the 
more of a difference in the problems <coughs> we're going to see between the line one and line four. Um, but yes, uh, smaller batches may have a different a different type of performance characteristic. It's going to have the same flavor, but the numbers are definitely going to change. Wouldn't you have a difference between 32-bit uh, and 64-bit uh, based operating system? That I never looked into. I expect that they're going to run true, fairly well true to form as far as there should be a fairly good predictability between the two. If something's running really fast in 32-bit, it should run really fast in 64 as well. What about uh, parallelization? <laughs> that is, that's actually something I looked at. And it actually, it depends on if the guy writes it for 64 bit. Yes. Yeah. There are a few apps that haven't fully written it for 64 bit. Just a very few of them. Yeah, I, ex I expect so. Um, that I don't have a real good feel for. I haven't really looked into that. <clears throat> Parallelization. That's an interesting topic in that um, some things, as you know, can be parallelized, uh, or parallelized and others can't. I came, I documented in one of the chapters a way to run a pipeline across multiple systems. So you can start a uh, pipeline, system A, shoot it to system B. Maybe system B's got a database on it that the pipeline needs to access. It doesn't have to go across. It can locate, it can access it locally, which should be faster. Send the results to, to host C that does something else, D, E, F. It's basically unlimited. It's however many steps you can put in the pipeline. You sort of paralyze it. In a line. So it would work in a cluster, but not necessarily on a single system. Right. With multiple uh, processors. Yes. Brings up another kind of the same uh, train of thought, but would there be certain things like if you're running a single threaded system versus a multiple core, multiple thread system, if you run a pipe command? Um, with a single core, single thread system, it would have to wait for each thing to execute. I'm wondering if, like, mixing things around and different commands would actually open up to it. Yes. Like, take a benefit of uh, multiple threads if it's not. Exactly. That's where benchmarking would be very valuable because on a given system, you know, depending on is it multi core, is it multi threaded, what kind of uh, internal architecture we're talking about, you could have a situation where something just you can't get it very well. You can't speed it up very much on just a single core, single thread system. Yeah. But put it on multi core, you might be able to really boost speed. And some 